Hello and welcome to the last word on Spurs. We are your award winning Tottenham Hotspur podcast. We are back as we gear up for the final remaining 10 games of the Premier League season. Maybe a spring in our step of what's to come now. I know many have been frustrated, waiting for this international break to be over. We can tell you it is. And Spurs are back in action very, very soon. If you're listening for the first time, wherever you've been, we're on iTunes, we're on Spotify, we're across all major audio platforms. We're of course on X, we are on Instagram, we are on Facebook too. We're joined by really, really amazing guests on this last word on Spurs. Amazing. Amazing guests that are going to talk you through, walk you through the business end of the season. Of course, a huge preview of Luton to come. And some really decent interviews you've had over the course of this international break where, look, you get some really good off-the-cuff interviews during the break. And to be fair, they're actually more interesting than the actual games themselves, which you guys will know if you've put yourself through watching some of that international football, which, to be fair, look, we're not going to drive you mad over. We'll give you a little bit of roundup on. But introducing the guests that are going to talk you through all things Spurs in the next, next hour or so. So I'd like to have back alongside me. He's been busy during this international break as well doing some stuff on his own channel. Chatty Patty's back. Patty, how are you, my man? Yeah, happy to be here, man. James, what's up? Sam, excited to be on with you guys. Excited to hear your thoughts. And yeah, Ricky, I put a show out on my own channel. I keep saying, as you know, I'm here, there and everywhere and I'm really busy. So it's hard because my channel's like, I've not put the work into it. So yeah, everyone check it out. At Patrick Tyrant on YouTube. Uh, it's basically my thoughts on the Fulham game and really where we go from there. It's not a depressing show. It's literally just basically my honest opinion of what happened, what went wrong and how we address that going into business end of the season. But yeah, Patrick Tyrant on YouTube, check it out. Uh, Chatty Patty episode 2.4. And yeah, Ricky, uh, I can't wait, man. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, go, I know Pat, many think the kind of game against Luton, I'm not saying everyone will feel this. Some will feel it's an absolute formality. Spurs should win. They should win. Let me just be clear in relation to the two teams and the squads. But um, we all know with Tottenham, being Tottenham, there is no game easy. And look, we're going to come on to that very, very shortly. Also, tonight like I said, we've got a debutant, finally, a long overdue one on this show. Tonight, like to welcome Sam, Liam Cornish to the show. Sam, love to have you on. How are you, first? Are you well? I'm doing good. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Ricky. And uh, yeah, nice to, nice to meet you, boys. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to be here. Listen, mate, likewise. Sorry it's taken so long, Sam. And, you know, mate, again, many will see you snapping away at the ground, being very busy on a Monday morning, sticking out all those wonderful pictures when we've won. Not your fault when it's quiet when we're not winning, so we don't talk about that. Same as James when we're not winning either. Uh, but Sam, give us some insight, because I know you've got something big coming up for you this weekend. Give us some insight into that. Yeah, so uh, before the, the Luton game, uh, I'm going to be at the Beehive. Uh, I'm going to be taking, I guess you can think, think of it as like a family photo. Um, with your your mates, your Spurs loved ones, uh, or you can get one solo, however you like it. I'll take one with you if you like. Um, and yeah, it's just going to be like really nice professional backdrop um, Spurs pictures. Um, and the whole point of it is to, to raise money for Tottenham Food Bank. Um, so I'm, I'm sure everyone knows that they're, they're tough times at the moment. Tottenham Food Bank in the last few years has, uh, the demand for it's increased 300%. So there's a lot of really, really needy people out there that, um, sort of not as fortunate as us that we can afford to go to the football and whatnot. So I'm just trying to give back to the community that gives so much to me uh, every week. And yeah, hopefully it'll be a really nice way to, to lead into the game. Come down, have a picture and, and donate to the food bank. So I've got to say that is absolutely lovely. And I mean, again, let's hope it is a game to remember because there's no doubt about it. We keep suggesting that these final 10 games to go. Uh, Ricky Norwood, bless him on the weekend, called them revision for the main exam. Adam Osper, called them 10 cup finals, which I know many don't want to use the word cup finals. I said they're fourth round FA cup ties. Don't call them fourth round FA cup ties. Don't call them fourth round Carabao cup ties either. They're just 10 absolute meaningless games that Spurs need to try and win for sure. And finally last, but say not least, we've got this man back on last word on Spurs. <laughs> It is 
of course, the wonderful James Black back on last one on Spurs. James, lovely to have you back on. How are you, firstly? Yeah, really good, man. Really good. Good to see you, boys. What a strong you lineup. Uh, you, you boys <laughs> on it as well. And that's uh, and uh, good luck with your debut, Sam. I've, I've got to say about Sam. Picture Thank you. Boys. They're absolutely insane. They're Cheers, mate. Unbelievable. So and if anybody does get, get a chance to go down there, uh, yeah. they are incredible. You'll get an incredible picture from them. And oh, Thank you. Superb as well. So, yes, yeah, a very if Spurs uh, lineups as strong as this on Saturday, <laughs> we'll, we'll be fine. We should be okay. Fingers crossed. There's in depth. Nikki, Nikki, just Sorry before you start, Sam, what time are you going to get out of the Beehive, and what time would you recommend people getting down there? Uh, so they're going to open from eleven o'clock, I believe. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be down there before then, setting up, and I'll hopefully start taking pictures just before twelve. Um, so yeah, roll up and, and come through anytime you'd like. I'm taking bookings at the moment as well, so um, you can get in touch with me. Just send me a DM, and I can reserve you a slot, and then. If you haven't booked a, a position, then I'll just try and squeeze you in where I can. Love that, Sam. And James, for those that want to check out what many do anyway. I mean, it's can't be honest, when James is there, <laughs> try and get to the man is, is what an admission itself to listen to the music. It's insane. James, where can people find you situated on the match day? So on Saturday, I always move around, but on Saturday I'm at Shelf Bar, uh, which is level one, block 120. Uh, but if you follow me on any socials, I always post up there where I'm playing. So if you go to the Voice of Spurs on like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, I'll always post on there where I'm playing. But Saturday is uh, it's, yeah, shelf bar block block one twenty. But get your picture done with Sam first. Picture done with Sam. Couple of James for the music. Couple of us after for the podcast. I love yeah, it. That's it. Yeah, that's right. I love it. There you go. What more do you want? What more do you want? That's what you call proper Saturday night, right? Or Saturday afternoon slash evening for you. We're gonna go straight into it, guys. Look, it's been an interesting last couple of weeks for Spurs. Unfortunately, we had to sit and stew frustratingly on that Fulham defeat. And look, I will open up if I can. Let's go to you, James, to begin with. You know, Postecoglou Spurs. They currently sit fifth. In the Premier League, as we went into that international break, three points behind Aston Villa in full for a game in hand. And, you know, again, we've got to say it's been a real mixed bag of the season so far. I think many would say we're definitely ahead of the project. I think, again, with Tottenham, the defeats they've had have been frustrating because they followed some really decent results where we just simply haven't seen them coming at times. Despite, of course, we know that early blip in the season where we had the 10 unbeaten, we had the uh, successive three to four defeats in the middle there. But it's mad to think, James, you know, that defeat against Fulham was only Spurs' second away defeat of the season. And the first game in which all season, Postacoglu's Tottenham haven't scored in. And after the game, Ange did not mince his words. He appeared to admit it was the worst performance under his stewardship. So how do you feel going into these final 10 games of the season, James, where we all know so much to play for and really a lot to come for Tottenham in these next final remaining games of the season? Well, I feel something like uh, I don't normally feel as a Spurs fan and I feel confident going into this last bit of the of the season. And th that, um, that run, that, isn't it like 30, 38, 39 games overall that we'd scored? And that... And we did that most of that run without the most prolific goal scorer we've ever had in our history. Uh, and, and so it shows you what Postacoglu is doing. It was a blip against Fulham, but I feel that that's going to be like rocky up the arse like for Luton game, and it's just going to be a complete game changer. I don't. I, I think that we kind of needed that. I know it's a cliche to say that when you lose like that, but we needed something like that to, to go into the last games to shake us up because. Uh, Man United only six points behind, I, I, I think, aren't they? And uh, Villa are three points. But, but I see that I've seen Villa starting to wobble. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm confident of the top four, and I might be coefficiently top five, but I'm confident of it. And uh, just the just the Fuller game has, has got me in shock. But I think this, I think Luton's come at the right time. I know we, I know some people might think it's a it's a banana skin. But I think uh, it's all going to be in those first 10 minutes. But I think we're going to roll them over quite easily, to be honest with you. And I don't usually say stuff like that. I'm like all normal Spurs fans who just don't, oh, don't say that. Do you know what I mean, I'm like everybody the same. But it feels different under Postacoglu. It feels like there's a difference there. And I feel, especially the big thing is if Mickey's going to be back. But if Romero and Mickey at the back there, um, like, yeah, I can't see us anything but a, quite a, a comprehensive win. I like that. I love the way, James, for those that are listening on audio, 
as James said, comprehensive win. He couldn't help but try and cover his mouth there for the fear of those words leaving his mouth. <laughs> you, know he's, you, know, you, know, you know, you know, you're a proper Spurs, but that's happening. Yeah, so, think, yeah, it's thingy, Reggie. I think we're winning. What is he trying to say? <laughs> Wait for his prediction later. He'll be behind the curtain giving it to us at that rate. Um, let's bring Sam in if we can. Um, look, Sam, you know, it's funny, you know, current form. Again, you look back at it, we've had a draw against Everton, win against Brighton, loss against Wolves. Uh, obviously, we've had the win against Palace in there, win against Villa, Fulham. It's been a real kind of up and down last six, seven games to Spurs. But quite interestingly, Sam, um, Spurs have suffered seven league defeats so far in the campaign. Six of them have come against teams currently sitting between seventh and twelfth in the Premier League. And the only exception to that rule was that home defeat to Aston Villa, where, as we know, Potokoglu saw on the day were made through plenty of plenty of chances. And, you know, it's unbelievable when you think we had that really impressive winning style of the 4-0 away at Villa Park. But Fulham joined Chelsea, Wolves, West Ham and Brighton, the list of teams sitting in the middle third of the table that have earned wins over Spurs. And remarkably as well, Spurs have just dropped four points of teams in the relegation battle, while pick up a respectable 12 points from seven games against sides in the top six, which is what we've got all to come. So you'd like to think, given our running, that this puts us in a fairly decent position. How do you feel, Sam, for you going into this business stage of the season now, where, as we know, points really do matter? Yeah, I'm feeling good. Like I, I think those that know me, I'm I'm very much an optimist when it comes to, to Spurs, particularly under Ange Postacoglu. Um I think the the biggest thing for me is getting through these these next three or four games where we're potentially playing against uh, teams going to sit in and low block us where we've we've struggled at home. You know we've we've all lived through the uh, the, the struggling first halves against Brentford and and Brighton as well. Um, and yeah, I think that that back end where where things look like they're going to get really tough. I'm I'm more optimistic finally than than uh, the yeah next four games. Um, but I think we're going to do fine. I think top four is definitely on the cards. Um, I'm, with James, I think that the, the wake up call hopefully will be enough from Fulham and we'll come out and I'm, man, I'm hoping that we, we put together a first half performance. Um, but yeah, I think that's, I won't get ahead of myself with that. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm feeling good, feeling optimistic and yeah, hopefully we can, we can finish strong. Um, top four for me is, is, it's it's going to happen. I love that, Sam. I love the confidence there. I mean, Patty bringing you in. You know, when we look at the fixtures across the final uh, 10 games of the season for those clubs in competition with us, Villa, and of course, Manchester United. You know, Spurs have got, you'd say, a favourable run of fixtures to come to some degree. Obviously, Luton up next for Tottenham. Then they're playing relegation threat and Forest that have also had a four-point deduction recently. As well as then, we end the season with back-to-back games against Burnley, receptively in 19th, Sheffield United in 20th. I mean, at the other end of the table, we know Spurs, for some are saying it's a daunting, truer games to come with Arsenal before travelling to Anfield and then, of course, ending with a home, against, home game against Man City. It is, of course, worth noting that Man City and Chelsea, those games are yet to be rescheduled. So I know many feel they may drop those games in the final weeks of the season. We know St. James's Park is a tough place to go as well. That's a 12.30. We know that might favour Spurs in terms of, again, the atmosphere of the crowd. I mean... Pat, what's your feeling going into this business end of the season now? How confident are you, given the nature of Spurs' inconsistency recently, we can secure a top four, top five finish? Which, again, I will reiterate the point of Ange. He said it. Top four is not really a prize that he's too concerned about. How do you see it for you, Pat? Yeah, I mean, you know, when we've had a season where there's been a lot of ups and downs, but on the whole, most Spurs fans will say it's been a good season so far. And, you know, we're, we're banging the mix for fourth. So I do want to see us finish strongly and finish in the top four. And like Sam and James are saying, I do believe we will. It's not it's not a formality. Um, you know, Fulham away showed us that no game is easy. Teams will raise their game to players. We are considered a scout. We're a big team. We're playing good attacking football. We've got some really good players in this team that other players will essentially use as a benchmark to show that they're a good player. So we have to go into these games wary that teams will raise their level to play us. Other managers will have a point to prove and will want to show their bit and try and get one over on Postacoglu. And I did feel that happened, uh, you know, on the Saturday where we played Fulham. So the guys need to, James said it best, it was lack of reality check and then rock it up their asses. And I hope that they now put this to the, you know, put, put teams to the sword. We're a team that scores a lot of goals. We do concede a bit and that's a, 
a bit of a concern. But on the whole, we've been playing some really good football. We show resilience when needed. We've shown fight, desire and grit when needed. Sometimes a bit of sloppiness has crept in. But yeah, all in all, you know, I, there's there's some big games in there. And to be fair, in the big game so far, like Arsenal away, where everyone said if we play the way we play, we're going to get battered. We went yep. there and pretty much played them off the park, did really well and deserved at least a draw. You know, we went to the uh, Etihad with um, a back four, including Romero and Ben Davis, the centre backs, and we got a point. Uh, we got a point there. We got a draw. So we've we've played the big games really well, apart from Chelsea at home. So you know, I don't go into the games worried, but I am a bit concerned with the game I saw. You know, against Fulham, hoping it's a blip. These things happen. Um, on my podcast, I did talk about basically Jurgen Klopp and also Pep Guardiola's first season and the anomalies and the bad games they had. And it's it's refreshing to see that the top managers in their first season, they did have these games where they got battered and beaten quite comprehensively by teams they should beat. So it's not like it doesn't happen, but obviously good teams then rectify that in the next game. So, you know... Luton at home is a potential banana skin, don't get me wrong. They're in the dogfight, they're fighting for their lives. They've got some good players on their day and obviously they don't want to go down. And it's quite funny because out of all the teams in the Premier League, I'd probably say like I've really won to Luton. They're essentially like my second team now, you know, they're not that far away from us. They play, considering they came up through the playoffs, they played a brilliant brand of football. They've been really unlucky in a lot of the games. So I do like them as a football club, but, and I want them to stay up, but obviously not at our expense. We need to get the three points I do feel confident going into it. I do. I think it was Sam or James. I'm not sure who said it, but the first 10 minutes will be key. As long as we start on the front foot and start, it's really funny how the first 10 minutes can usually show you how the game's going to go. And I really want us to start well, start, you know, push fresh out the gates or fresh out the blocks. But obviously don't be naive defensively. Um, but I think we'll be fine. Some big games coming up, obviously. But this is this is crunch time now. This is where you see what the players are made of. And so far, every big game that we played, you've yep. really yep. done well, essentially. Even in the Chelsea game, I know we lost and some people called me a loser for saying that I was proud of the team. But the people that understand and that was at the stadium and even watching on TV, you understood why we were proud because we went down mm. fighting. And there's yep. ways to lose games. And if you lose like that, of course you're frustrated. You never want to lose a game, but at least you saw some fight and desire. But against Fulham, I didn't see any of that. And that was my concern. So hopefully yeah. we get it right. Players and manager, I was a bit worried that Ange just stood there for the whole game. I didn't really like to see that and didn't really make changes. I think our first sub was on the 67th minute, which mm. is insane to me considering that we, were, we weren't at it at all. But yeah, it's a learning curve for everyone, fans, players, manager. And I do hope we put full into the sword and really show everyone that we're still a team to be, to be feared and a team to be you know reckoned with. I think the key is, Pat, if we could attack that Luton game, the same way we've attacked, as you've mentioned there, some of those big games. I think we actually will be all right in these final 10 games. It's just, I don't know, again, Sonny kind of referred to it as maybe a bit of complacency. I mean, the attitude is so important that we are 100% taking these games seriously because, um, I mean, James, you know yourself, you know, we're all easy to get up for the big games. You know that the stadium being there pre-game and post-game, you know, we can all get up for the Arsenal's at home, the United's at home, the Chelsea's at home. These are the games where sometimes the reliance is on maybe the players to raise the fans. How important is that, James? And you notice as well, mate, trying to thrive us being that 12th man, that um, it's a two-way job now, isn't it? Between now and the end of the season, both have got to play their part, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I've got that Burnley away game in my head. Do you remember that? that, that was it 5-1 or something? That's the sort of thing. That's what we need to yeah. be doing from the start. Mm. And I do think on these sort of... Uh, Grades of games, if you will, uh, that, the, that the players have to help out with the fans yep. because uh, they're going—they're not having that same passion of walking in with this. Well, we've got the same feeling, but they're, they're up for it as much as your Man City, Arsenal's. But I don't know. I, I feel this this game, uh, considering the games we've got coming up, is is quite pivotal because oh, uh, huge. absolutely huge. We put in a huge performance now. Yeah, um, we blow them away, and the goal difference, which could come yep. into play Spot as well. You know what I mean, yep. if we if we yep. do that. I think then we're off to uh, with this West Ham next, then Forest mm. isn't it, after that. Then if we go off the back well, of uh, a great display and a great yep. win, I think that will kick us into to the fourth place. But yeah, I, what I want to see, I think Patrick just touched on it just then. It, it it's the basics they didn't have, which which was concerning mm. that basic drive. Yeah, that I've not seen that. I don't think it's this. It's been season. there, hasn't it? For most of the games, like I said, they've actually had that marker there. 
for whatever reason, the games we've lost. I mean, there's been games where you could arguably say in periods we haven't played well, but I think it's the first time, James, you touched upon there, there's been that accusation aimed at them of a lack of attitude, well, yeah. the lack of the wrong attitude and maybe perceived effort, right? Yeah, and when they've had it, usually mm. second half they turn it around and they didn't even, yep. they wasn't, they, that wasn't even there. So that was the concern. Um, yep. I'm going to say this, even though I, I love the dragon and, and nobody can feel Mickey's shoes, but um, I think missing, I don't think it would have been 3 0 if Mickey Van der Members at the back. And that's a big say. The, the whole team yeah. did Don't get me yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah. The whole yeah. team did perform. But I yep. think it's so key to the way that we're playing the, to mm. Ange Ward, uh, that yep. high line, et cetera. That Probably said, I, I still think uh, Dragerson's a fantastic player. And I think you, you only have to look at pre season where Vicario weren't as great as he was in the start uh, in pre season as he was in the season. So giving someone like that the, the chance and their, um, their due diligence for how they can play, definitely. But yeah, I was, I think Mickey's a big miss. And I'm really waiting on Friday to see if he's, if he's playing, really. I think yeah. it'd be. I think it would be a game changer, even with somebody in the relegation yeah. fight. But it is a worry. Patrick's right that you, someone is fighting for their Premier League lives. Their their whole yeah. season is is on these games now. And yeah. with not Forest getting that points deduction, there's a bit more for Luton to chew on. Mm. Go for it's not an ideal situation, but we're at home. It's against Luton, and we've yeah. got to get up for this. And the same yeah. as the players, though, Ricky. I've got to say the fans yeah. have got to get up for this. The fans yeah. have got to turn in there. I've, the, the, the atmosphere at that stadium is absolutely insane this season. It's unbelievable. So unrecognisable, isn't it, James? I mean, you consider when yeah. you've been playing there for a number of years. I mean, I suppose you can't put into correlation the difference between what it's been like previous seasons to this one, right? No, it's like uh, yeah. when you un undo a bottle of Coke that's about to fizz <laughs> out. Do you know what I mean? We've been waiting for this because Spurs fans are the greatest in the world, the greatest passion yeah, yeah. in the world. Absolutely. It's about to put up with Conte and Mourinho. <laughs> where now you can unlock that bottle of coke and it's just gone bang. So yeah. it's just that I, I I think that we will be behind them from the start the same way as if mm. it's any other game. I think Spurs fans will realise the situation. Um, but yeah, I just um, my concern is that Luton are fighting for their lives. That's the only really yeah. concern I've got from the opposition. You know, I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing there, James. You know, I, I just wonder, James, if it's a good or bad thing now, that points deduction, because if anything, that's kind of really, pardon the yeah. pun, spurred Luton on, right, for this uh, obviously yeah. international break to come to an end. Yeah, definitely. I have a few uh, friends that are Luton fans, and they're like, they're really up for this now since that mm. point. They're like, it's, it's like a light at the end of the tunnel um, yes. uh, for them that's being shown. So it is a, it is definitely a concern. But that back to the start, that, that first five, ten minutes, mm. you get a couple of... Uh, Madison's amazing assist, oh. like he's been showing the sheriff. Wouldn't that be nice? And then we're in. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> It'll be nice. You know, on that point, James, kind of you, Sam, I think one thing that has been really kind of leveled at the team has been really sometimes the maybe potential slow start in first halves. And I think, again, what I will say to qualify this is that what we do find at home, which is becoming more and more the case, that there is that ultimate respect now being paid to Spurs, where teams like the Brentfords, the Brightons, that will come and essentially put maybe nine, ten behind the ball and say, break us down. And therefore, what's been accused of Tottenham is that they are really becoming hard to watch at home and not, they're not breaking teams down. But uh, I think what is becoming more and more knowledgeable now and noticeable is that it is really hard to break teams down. Generally, teams now, in comparison to the Premier League 10, 11 years ago, they are so better world coached. They've got so better players. They've got much better managers that every game now, as we know, with the Premier League, it's really hard to call because I'll tell you, anyone does an ACA on a weekend, there's always that one team in an ACA that always lets you down because the Premier League is the most unpredictable league in the world. So when I say to you, Sam, I think we discussed this off air with Patty there, that um, I think you have to go back to Everton away for Spurs' last goal at well, in the first half. And I believe, correct me wrong, Patty, I think you read out the date there. What was the date for that Everton away game now? Can you remind me? Is it, are we going back into, is it December? Remind yeah, me? 23rd of December. December. 23rd of December. Sam, how much has that got to change and how much is this the perfect opportunity to change that, Sam? Yeah, I think um, sort of tying it into what, what you guys were saying before, I'm, I'm a big believer of um, that, that that atmosphere has to be mutual. Like I know a lot of people think that the energy has to come off the pitch and and that's how we sort of create atmosphere at Tottenham, that we respond to what is happening in front of us. But I think you've got to meet them halfway sometimes and and at least from from the beginning, let let the players know that you're up for it. Um, and I think that that sort of mentality will, will help if the place is absolutely buzzing and rocking. 
um, and there's no complacency in the air from the stands, uh, in my head, that would translate onto the pitch and and hopefully we'd, we'd, we'd get the business done. I think in, in terms of the slow starts for the first half, um, I guess I tried to look at on the bright side and think that all we need is five, ten minutes of, of actually switching on and we, we just blitz teams. We saw it against Brentford and, and Brighton towards the end as well um, in, in recent history. Um, but yeah, we just need to need that to happen at the start and and just kill teams. So don't give them a sniff um, from from the very beginning, and then I think we'll we'll start to to really steamroll some of these sides and and kill their confidence from the beginning. So I'd like to see. I know it's I know like you're saying it's a lot easier said than done because yeah. you know we can look at look at the lights of, of Man City over the years and and Liverpool and and even that lot down the road. It, it does take time to to break teams down if they're going to you know stick eleven players in the penalty area. Um, it's why you see so many late winners because it, it, it takes 90 minutes to win a game sometimes. I think we need to maybe be a little bit more understanding as a fan base that even your likes of, of, of City, that they don't win every game 6-0. Um, it, they do grind out results. That's what makes winning teams. And we have done that to an extent this season. And I think it's, it's important to also remember that it is a young side. They're learning to play this new way. It's a complete opposite to what we were doing last season. And, you know, Success will come with time, and I think patience would would be the way to go with it. I think it'll be appreciated. Yeah, fingers crossed. I totally agree with you on that. And um, yeah, I'm just going to revert back to sorry guys, revert back to the international break for literally a couple of minutes. I know it's going to bore everyone, but just to bring everyone up to date of where we stand, and I can already hear the snoozing in the background. James has set the alarm; he's going to clock off in a second. Um, look, it's a time where many do obviously, like I say, keep their fingers crossed that their players are going to go away, come back, and hopefully all be okay. Such is the nature of Tottenham. We know Spurs tend to keep their injury news fairly quiet under Ange, and we don't really know until up and well until the pre-match presser, which will be on Friday for us, where we'll get a firm update from Ange Postecoglou. I say it's Friday, but with the Easter, of course, approaching, uh, maybe it might be potentially Thursday. So we'll see in terms of the day of the presser. But look, um, what's interesting is obviously Spurs, as we know, they ended that 39-game Premier League scoring streak despite having the fourth most shots per game in the league with an average of 15.4. However, that's mad because it hasn't translated to goals galore. 59 scored, only the joint fifth highest in the competition, 11 less than leaders Arsenal. Sorry to read that out, guys. Really apologies for that. Um, In terms of international break and what's happened on there, uh, Captain Sonny, uh, he's been involved. He's got a goal um, uh, against Thailand, where for them it was a 1-1 draw. Not what they would have wanted in terms of qualifying, but it does mean for Sonny now that he's been involved this season with 14 goals and eight assists from his 25 Premier League matches. And overall, um, that strike on the Thursday meant it was seven goals and three assists for South Korea this campaign in a goal laden season, which has brought 32 goal involvements for both club and country. And it's fair to say, I think, again, we look at Sonny last season, there was many concern whether Sonny had lost his goal scoring touch. Well, again, those stats there go to show Sonny still very much amongst the goals. Um, later that evening at the time, Brennan Johnson netted a close range goal, but an important one for Wales at the time in their second half of the Euros playoff semi-final against Finland. But unfortunately for Wales, it didn't end obviously well for them. They had heartbreak in a penalty shootout, which saw Ben Davis involved for 120 minutes plus, who has got his coaching license, I understand, this week, which is congratulations to Ben, along with Joe Roden currently on loan and Brennan Johnson playing 70 minutes plus there. Uh, in terms of other contributions, Diane Kulisewski, he was back amongst the goals in terms of involvements as well. He grabbed an assist for Sweden in a 5-2 defeat to Portugal in a friendly. It's worth noting on Diane Kulisewski that he referenced during the international break that in the future, when I'm going to be at my best, it's going to be in a central role. So, again, what you love about this international break is you sometimes get these off-the-cuff comments there from the players. And, again, it'll be interesting to see, because we have seen Anne sometimes change Deanne's role. I think, again, Kroszewski's had it labelled at him, the lack of consistency. It'll be interesting to see, obviously, how that manifests itself now between here and the end of the season and whether there will be a potential change. But, obviously, Spurs have got a number of options in midfield. And talk about midfielders, Giovanni and Celso, you won't be surprised to hear, was back amongst the goals for Argentina. Be nice if you can play for Spurs, but there you go. That's another subject of a sore one. Uh, Kuta Romero also involved as well. Pat Matasar was in action for Senegal in a 3-0 win over Gabon. He was also an unused substitute in Senegal's 1-0 win over Benin. There was 90 minutes for Radu Dragashin as Romania drew 1-1 with Northern Ireland. And he played a further 45 minutes in Romania's 3-2 defeat to Colombia 
and James Madison, as James said there, the sheriff was involved and saved England with a last minute assist for Jude Bellingham to avoid a defeat to Belgium. Some of the interviews to come out of that international break, we saw one with Guillermo Vicario, who spoke about his love playing for Tottenham, that bond with Mickey van der Ven. He said, I've got a great and good feeling along with Mickey. He's a good guy, very good guy for me. I try to speak to him as much as I can when we're around each other, both inside and outside the pitch. We spend a lot of time together, the same in Manor, Destiny, Cootie and Rodrigo. He believes that the current group of Tottenham players has a bright future under Ange Postacoglu if they can remain together as a unit. He said, we're very young. We hope to stay together for a very, very long time because we have that quality, that togetherness, that desire, and we believe we can achieve something special in the future. And James, you touched upon him. I'll all let you come back in on Macario because he's one that you said there, James. You know, in pre-season, um, isn't it funny? Because pre-season can always kind of give you a narrative that you've got concerns about a player. But um, I would say from onwards, the Manchester United game, where he made a magnificent save, and we know that little wobble in between where players were targeting him. He's been one of Spurs' players of the season, right, Vicario? Even in games like the Fulham game, where that was a really poor performance on the day, he still made a couple of really good saves for the club. Yeah, see, and that, that kind of shows you a, a little bit, I guess, the worrying side of some parts of Ange, but where Vicario is actually making two to three world-class saves a game, hasn't he? But he's, he's, yep. he's, he's been incredible. I think you missed out the most important part of the international break, and that was Hoiberg pushing a referee over. That was the best. I was bit. I was coming on to that, James. You put you read oh, my sorry. skit. There. <laughs> that was the. Best that was bit. funny though. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you can see that guy's so frustrated playing for not playing for Spurs, can't you? Just attacking yeah. referees now. Jesus Christ! That that and um, do you know? Uh, and Dane Scala scored five, didn't he? In, in, yeah. in, that was incredible. He scored a hat trick and, and two. That yeah. was that, that was amazing. But yeah, no, uh, Vicario, yeah, he's, he's he's probably been the signing. I think he's been the number one signing for me over it. It's between, it's between him and Mickey. But uh, Vicario, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. But then I was watching him in pre-season, and I don't know if the rest of you guys are the same. I was thinking, oh, I hmm. wasn't thinking what I'm thinking now. I was thinking, there was a few yeah. doubts. I think it was the West Ham game with the crossing and that, and that was it just concerned me a little bit. But um, yeah, absolutely incredible. He made a couple of good saves for Italy, didn't he, as well, didn't he? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, he did. I, I, I yeah, did. Couple, yeah, he did make a couple of good saves. Like I say, for Vicari himself, it was a fairly assured performance for him, of course, on his first start for Italy. So, like I say, great for him. Destiny also involved. And quite interestingly, if I can come around to you, Pat, um, Rodrigo Bentoncourt, you know, he played 35 minutes for Uruguay in their 1 1 draw with Basque. He then followed that up with a further 45 minutes in a 2 1 loss to Ivory Coast. He then confirmed after that he's been playing for Spurs and Uruguay, respectively with a broken little toe in the recent weeks. He went, look, the truth is now, the ankle is fine. Luckily, the knee has recovered. None to speak of other than that, just one broken toe. I broke the little toe to the left foot two or three weeks ago, but this is one I'm still playing the same. I broke one of my phalanx, and I would have hoped to have stopped for three to four weeks so that it could heal, but it wasn't possible. It was before the Crystal Palace match in London in a training session with a teammate, but it's almost there. I'm playing with my toe recovering. But the truth is that once I warm up, I forget it. I didn't want to stop, so I'm fine. I'm feeling good 100%. And to be fair, you know what, Pat? He's been one of those players, Benton Core, that as soon as in his mind he felt he wanted to play, we know from Ange, he was almost banging down his door saying, I want to be part of the squad. And we saw, of course, away, I believe it was at Palace, that unbelievable reception he got from the Spurs fans when he did come on for a period. And I think it's worth acknowledging, Pat, you know, again, it shows you again here, we don't think it goes on behind closed doors. So I think it's fair to say that we've all suggested on this show in the last few months that Benton Core hasn't been the same player that he's been, obviously, pre his injury. But we all back him to get back to his best because we all know recovering from the nature of an ACL, that's not an easy task to try and navigate. So does that again reinforce the fact, dear Pat, players are always going through certain injuries that we don't know about and why we should sometimes give them the benefit of the doubt until we know they are 100% tip-top. Yeah, I think it's it's um it's a tough one because pretty much every player in the Premier League probably plays with some sort of knock or niggle or something going on. No one's always or typically 100%. So some players are always carrying injuries and naturally, you know, if they're fighters and they want to give their all for the team, they're going to push through it. Um, ben Tanker hasn't been at his best, but I think sometimes fans are a bit harsh on him because I've seen him have some good uh, cameos and some good games. But yeah, he's not been as sharp and as 
dynamic as he was obviously last season before the injury but it takes time I guess and um it's a bit of a tricky one because Basuma's naturally not been at his best. Madison hasn't been at his scintillating best, but you see Madison in 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 um in stints can still turn it on and produce a moment of magic. But I don't know, are we as fans sometimes too harsh and critical of these guys, or do we know what their capabilities are and we obviously want that to be shown, you know, 90 plus minutes? I don't know. It depends, you know, how where where you lie and, and what your thoughts are on that. But I mean you know, all the talking is cool, but if you're not 100% and you know you're not 100%, it's a tough one. You know, it's it's, it's difficult because he's saying once he warms up, then he forgets it. So it's almost like, mm. why are you bringing it up? I don't really understand why you're bringing it up if you're saying once you warm up, then you, you're not sure. So is he mm. saying it to let us know that we should maybe be a bit more relaxed about him? Or is he just letting... I, I don't know. I don't really understand the thesis behind it, but... You know, um, I think he's a fantastic player and obviously I want him to be at his best. I need all the players to be at their best, man. We've got yeah. ten, 10 games, is that right? 10 games yeah, left? Yeah, 10 games. Yeah, Yeah, and um, no more excuses. You know, I, I'm sick and tired of the excuses. I just want to see the players leave it all on the on the pitch. Yeah. And like I said earlier, if we lose a game, fair enough. We're not probably going to win every single one of those games. Hopefully we yeah. don't lose any of them. I'd love us to win all 10 of them. Why not? Mm. But, yeah. um, you know, I just want to see the guys just give the all and leave it all on the pitch and and then we just see where we like if, if we do that we're more than capable of 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 our finishing strong but you know I don't want to see any uh, I don't you know after the game against Fulham I was just annoyed when I kept seeing the same stuff coming out from the guys are oh, you know we know we didn't give our all blah 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 it's all well and good saying that but give it on the pitch and I know sometimes things do happen but come on man so, yeah, I don't know. I, um, you know what, Pat? Back to that point. Is, it, is, that, is that the fact, though, Pat? And I, I want you to come back on this. Is that the fact, Pat, that the expectation now set of this group has been so, so high in terms of their attitude and the way they've got about games? That That's the frustration that when you saw those messages come out afterwards, like you said there, you don't want to see them because you know they're so much better to be able to be capable of the performances they can put in, right? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I do rate guys like Romero because they are always first to come out and hold their hand up and say, you know what, we weren't great. And, you know, you see Sonny do it all the time. But sometimes in the Fulham game, it was really concerning because no one really tried to rally the troops or, you know, really push the, the guys to, to step up. So I, I don't know, maybe it was just one of those days. Sometimes no matter what happens, you just you just know it's not going to be your day because I think the referee gave like seven or eight minutes injury time. And I was just thinking, please, just blow the whistle. Like, everyone could tell we weren't going to score. You know, typically when you see seven minutes on the clock, you're like, come on, we got a chance. But you knew that it was not happening in that yeah. game. It was just one of those days. So maybe it is one of those. You just chalk it off, charge it to the game, and hope yeah. you never see it again. So, yeah, you know, I don't want to sound like a bit basically like a bastard, but I'm just like, come on. I don't want to see no more of these comments. I just want to see us leave it all on the pitch, and then we go from there. And, um... Yeah, the same as fans as well. We need to, every time we're there, home yeah. and away. I think the away fans are always fantastic, don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're amazing. But sometimes at home, the atmosphere can sometimes be a bit... We need to also get behind the guys and really push them on as well. If we see they're, they're waning a bit or struggling, really, you know, give it your all and and, and be the extra man, be the 12th man and, and push them through, you know. Oh, man, I totally agree. I think, Pat, you need this Luton game to come, mate. You need it to come. <laughs> you do. Um, you know what? I want to come around to Sam if I can. Um, you know, we talk about obviously Benson Core there. He explained the fact that for him, he just wanted to be available for Andrew as soon as possible, Sam. And I think for me, there's no doubt about it, Benson Core definitely would be in my first 11 when everybody's fit. I think he's that good at the moment. And you know what? I'll let Pat come back in a second because we've had a situation around the international break with Basuma where he's reportedly been really frustrated and actually furious that he wasn't selected by Marley to the point what we understand again, I don't quite know because I don't follow the Marley social media accounts where he actually unfollowed the account and removed any association from himself with Marley. Now, um, again, you can look at it in different ways. You know, Basuma, do you think, Sam, we're going to see that player that we saw in those first 10 games of the season? I really hope so. I really hope so because he was a joy to watch, wasn't he? Like, being in that south stand, watching him like nutmeg Casemiro um, yeah. against United was—I I won't forget that. Um, I, I do think it's important to caveat the point on on Benton Kerr that these guys are, are you know, the the top zero point one percent professionals in the world, and 
I yep. think if it, I think there is always like a little bit of an element of fear if if you, particularly with him, because he's had three injuries that have kept him out in in the last year or so um, for for quite a long time, and you know he probably doesn't want to give the likes of Basuma a, an opportunity to take his spot. I think it's as simple as that. If he, if he feels fit to play, he's going to play. Um, but yeah, frustratingly, as fans, we're not seeing the best of him. So I think it's just important to caveat that that the mentality of a, a professional footballer like that is, you know, I don't want to miss out and, and lose my spot and miss even more football because I didn't put my hand up and say I was ready to play. Um, but but maybe it has come back to bite him a little bit because he's not been 100. percent So, um, but yeah, onto onto Basuma, I think uh, I'd, we'd all love to see that player. I think we need that reliable number six that's going to you know, not put the foot on the ball. We needed that against Fulham. We need someone to put the foot on the ball and yeah. just dictate the tempo of the game because we could all just see that that game was running away from us and we were getting bullied. We were getting... They just had so much more intensity in every element of that match and we, we really needed somebody to dictate that game and we could have used Basuma, uh, well, well, the best of Basuma um, in, in that match, I think. But hopefully it's just around the corner. Hopefully we'll see it Saturday. Yeah, fingers crossed. I mean, I will let you come back in on it, Pat, because you actually raised an agreement with us about Basuma. And, you know, we actually, again, discussed him on the show we had at the weekend where, again, there's a hope that he'll get back to that player that he was. And I maybe referenced the fact that whether those first 10 games were maybe an exaggeration of the quality of Basuma and whether we'll get that player back. And, again, it makes the point that, you know, we're going to come on to discuss Richarlison a second in terms of what that guy has gone through from a mental health perspective. We've discussed Benson Corey, of course, carrying an injury. And again, we're not privy to what goes on behind the scenes. And you have to wonder, Pat, you know, is this something more afoot with Basuma? Because to have those first 10 electrifying games, and what I would say is in defence for him against Fulham, I thought he was left totally exposed by Madison and Saar on the day. And therefore, where many were absolutely tearing strips of Basuma, yes, he was nowhere near his best. Yes, he could have been better, no doubt about it. But um, I think if you looked at that game again in the cold heart of day, there was elements where he didn't play anywhere near his best. But there were times where I think he was left exposed, which were reasons behind why he didn't have a good day in relation to that Fulham game. But overall, Pat, are you fairly confident we'll get to see that Basuma again we saw in that opening 10? Or are you concerned that was just literally as I mentioned, a bit of an exaggeration of the guy's ability. You know what? Funny enough, against Fulham, I actually thought he played quite well, to be fair. I don't think anyone played great, but him and Vicario, for me, were the better players on the pitch. And there was a, there was a really good tackle in the box where the commentators were on his back saying, oh, that was so risky and dangerous. But it was a clean tackle. He won the ball and he, he did break up play quite a bit. It sounds crazy because obviously we got absolutely smashed, but he was definitely one of the better players probably the best player on the pitch, you know, Vicario's in goal uh, on the day. But going back to the Mali incident, him getting dropped, I really rate and respect them for doing that because he's obviously their best player, but he's been nowhere near his best. And sometimes the top players will always coast through and always naturally get selected because of their ability or what they've done previously. But he's not been good enough. And it's a clear message to him to pull your socks up and, and sort yourself out. And I think that may even leave us in good stead because he'll get the message that he needs to do better. And um, I, I know he should know this already, but sometimes you need a rude awakening like that. So hopefully that does send some shockwaves and really like it's a light bulb moment that he needs to step up and play at the top level all the time because we know he's got it in him, going back to your point, Ricky. But at the end of the day, you can't be living off you know the credit in the bank. At some point, that's going to run out. And if I'm being honest, it has run out now. We need to see that best because it is in there. At the beginning of the season... You know, look how good Declan Rice has been. And at the beginning of the season, I, there was Matt. He's, he's about literally, who's... Pat, do you not yeah. think with Declan Rice, and please come back on this, I feel he has literally pulled Arsenal into a title exactly. race. He's yeah. been that good for them, right? You know, and I don't want to obviously mention Arsenal players. Sorry, I hate sorry. Sometimes you've got to mention them in the sense of, look how good Declan Rice has been. And there was massive arguments about who was the better player. And typically at the beginning of the season, everyone was saying Basuma, but... Declan Rice has been consistently brilliant throughout the whole course of the season where Basuma's been like that and then he's dropped off. So it's in there. We know it's in there. He just needs to bring it back, man. And maybe, I don't know, I don't know what he's, he's like in, you know, in his personal life, but just realign yourself, refocus and, and, and just go again, man, because it is there and um, we just need to see it because at the end of the day, a good Basuma makes Tottenham tick um, yeah. and it really helps us, you know, in that, 
in that central part of the... Because one thing I've realised, and I saw it in the Fulham game, like, we need someone like a Paulinho. Like, Fulham had Paulinho just That's breaking incredible play. Incredible play. Incredible you know, play, yeah. stopping, stopping all the attacks, yeah. taking yeah. a foul if he needed to. Uh, I mean, yeah. they got away with a lot. The referee did let them get away with a lot, don't get me wrong. But we didn't seem yeah. to have anyone like that protecting our back line. Our back line was so exposed. Yep. And uh, we need someone, if it's Basuma, if it's Bentanka, whoever, to do that, do that job and do it properly. We got the players and with the skill set to do it. But against Fulham, oh my God, they just all went at war, like you said. And they just left us exposed and we absolutely got ruined. And I don't know if it was like, if it was the perfect storm where everything that could go wrong went wrong in one game. But it did really show me that we need, if it's not going to be those guys, we need someone in the summer to come in and do that because yeah. it was quite worrying to see that. And obviously, if other teams take that blueprint and continue to do, you know, play like that, it could be concerning. But I'm just going to go off the point that as one game, we know the guys have got more than enough to pull it back and uh, yeah. hopefully they do that. We do. Listen, fingers crossed we do. Just on bits, I think many have made that point that, you know, when the going gets tough, that's when you need to show up. And I think, again, this will be the key now. 10 remaining games to come. The going is getting tough. And this is where we need Basuma to stand up and really be counted. And we'll come on to very, very shortly in terms of the manager's got to make for that midfield, of course, at the weekend. Um, James, you brought him up. It's only right I come back around to you. Pierre Mirhoibier. Yes, he did push over referee <laughs> during the international break. Uh, he scored and captain the, da the Danish side to a 2 0 win over the Faroe Islands. After the game, he was questioned and he admits he's frustrated by the fact that he's not starting enough this season. He said, look, of course I'm not happy with what's going on at the club in reference to game time. It's no secret, but it's something I make a fuss about. It's something I don't make a fuss about either. I could put my head on the pillow knowing that I'm giving my all to the coach that he should believe in me. This is not the case at the moment and it's the coach who has to explain why I'm not playing as opposed to the other way around. I think, James, the one thing we can say about Hoy Bier that, um, look, he's an ultra professional. I don't think you could ever question his attitude, his application. I think the reality is that maybe the team has now moved further along in terms of what they're trying to do and maybe for Poirier it doesn't really kind of suit his game so I mean is it now just a case James of getting to the end of the season I'm sure Pierre will get his summer move but all we need now in these final 10 games is everyone to give their best I'm going to unmute James right, unmute James yeah I um, I always saw him as a same way as I saw Ivan Perisic just like bringing on some older heads to, to see games out when we're, at, we're ahead. I mean, you look at that midfield we've got, we've got we've got Basuma, Madison, Saar, uh, and Kulu can play in there as well uh, as a number 10. We have got, like, amazing players. I, always, I never sort of see him as a starting player, but more of a coming on to see games out. And I, I imagine any professional footballer would not want to be thought of like that. But I think that's reality for Hoiberg now in this, in this setup. But yeah, we do need everybody to have that attitude that he's got. I do. You can never question his attitude, uh, that engine that he's been for us for a long time. But um, I don't see him as, as, a, as a key man in the midfield really anymore, other, other than coming on. Uh, the same way as I saw until he got injured, unfortunately, Ivan Perisic. Um, so for me, that I, I think if you're starting Hoiberg, that means you're, if you're dropping Bentoncourt and Basuma, I, I, th I think he's he's behind them still for me. Maybe even even Basuma still with even mm. the way that he's been playing, I'd still start the way that he played for Brighton for so long. Yeah, um, and that that Basuma doesn't just disappear, so it's just coaxing it out of him. And I, I'm sure we're going to touch on this with other players as well. It's more, um, we, these players are human beings as well. Of course, you know? of course. When, when they're yeah. When they're struggling, they need a bit of love from the fans rather than the other way around sometimes. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, I, I never really saw, well, I'm saying that and then saying this about Hoiberg, but uh, I, don't, I don't see Hoiberg as a, as a starter, unfortunately. No, I see him as yeah. a 60, 70 minutes, come on, see the game out in, in a fantastic manner. Don't get me wrong, I think he's brilliant. Yeah. But I think, I think the way that we're going, that you touched upon there, Ricky, the way that we're going as a team now doesn't really fit into that mould of a, of a Hoiberg starting a game. Yeah, I think, you know what, James, in a bizarre way, he's one of the one of the players that I think has got a really important role to play between now and into the season. Because like you said there, in these next remaining games, there will be times that we'll need to call upon him and hopefully Massive. be that experienced head to see out those games. Because I think the reality is that we know with the fluidity of the way Spurs play under Ange that um, the whole squad will be required. I think Ange has done really well to keep the main bulk of that squad on board for the season. And for a player of Hoybier that wants to be playing every single week 
I think he is frustrated by the fact he's not been. And again, credit to him because he could quite easily sit there and collect his wages and, yeah. you know, sit on the bench. But he wants to play. And, you know, again, I don't think we ever criticise a player for wanting to play because I think that's what you're in the game no. for, right? As a professional. I think, I think the, the modern football and the way that Angie's playing it, I think that it is about, it really is about a squad. It isn't about yep. 11. It no, really exactly. is about 16, yep. 17 on, on, with the bench as well on yep. that day. And he has an incredible important like, part mm. to play in that. Um, Spawn. If, if you're like, if you're like, say, one nil up against Man City and a Hoiberg's coming on, you'd like to see that, is, is my point. You'd, you'd think, yep. right, he's a bit of experience, he's going to help see mm. the game out, etc. I'd yep. like to see that happening. Um, but yeah, that's my that's my take on that. Listen, we'll see. He's got a big important role to play. Another player, uh, similar to that again, has come under some criticism this season at times. Again, when you see what the guy's going for at the moment, it's hard to not show an outpouring of love. And that is Richarlison. He was not in action during this latest round of international games. It was an unused sub in both of Brazil's friendlies against England and Spain. He spoke out about his mental health struggles following Brazil's exit from the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. He said that he wanted to give up and really struggled to come to terms with the situation that he found himself in. He described it as the feeling of worse than losing a family member. He went on to say, before I went home, I went to training. I wanted to go back to my room because I don't know what was even going through my head. I even went and told my dad I was wanting to give up. It's a kind of sad talk that, you know, what I went through after the World Cup, just giving these, discovering these things at home from people I'd lived with for many, many years, over seven years. It is crazy to go to my father, who was the guy who chased my dream with me and say, Dad, I want to give up. Is crazy. I want to give up. It's crazy. I just played in the World Cup. Man, I'm at my peak. I was reaching my limit, you know. I don't know. I'm not going to talk about killing myself, but I was in that depression mode and I wanted to give up. And I even wanted to be mentally strong. But after the World Cup, it all fell apart. The forward admitted to seeking help. He obviously... Uh, decided to go to a psychologist. He went on to say that that guy, he owes him everything because for him, he took him out of the world of football to some degree, outside the pitch too. And before there was maybe a prejudice, he thought, you know, again, crazy things. But it really made him understand that, you know, for him, it made him love life again. And again, there's a really important story in there from Richarlison that you know, that's a guy that is such an emotive character that, um, you know, Tottenham... And people will laugh at this outside of Spurs. Spurs are a huge, huge football club. And some players we've seen, some amazing players that have come here and really struggled to adapt to maybe the price tag or the actual general size of the club. And to be fair, look, at Everton, he was their main man. At Brazil, to some degree, he's been their main man at times. And I just wonder, you know, coming over to you, Sam, but the fact that, you know, at Tottenham, it has been a bit of a stop-start in terms of goals and the way they've come, whether the fact that because he hasn't been ultra consistent in terms of the goals, that's also played a pivotal factor in maybe the fact that he's not been his happiest on the field as well, despite what's going on in his personal life, Sam. Do you feel he can be that main man for Tottenham? Yeah, I think he's already been that this season. Uh, he scored, I think, was it nine goals in, in nine games or, or ten yeah. games? It, that's right. It was, yep. Yeah, phenomenal goal ratio. And when we needed him most, when when Hyungman Son was away on international duty and we had injuries coming out of our nose, um, like he he's been that guy. And and like you said, he's been that guy for Brazil. He's been that guy for Everton. He's done it all. I think he unfortunately just was filling the biggest boots that could ever be filled. Um, you know, sort of backing up after having Harry Kane as our number nine for years on end and. That comes with levels of expectations from fans and, and what they want from their uh, their number nine. Um, so it's it's it was pretty tough from the off from him, um, and he was obviously had not so many minutes as, or as many minutes as he'd like last season. And then um, I guess he basically found out on on the day before the season started that he was going to be the guy, um, and then all that pressure came all at once. Um, yeah. So you know I, I'm a massive fan of him um, and. And I'll always back him. I think what he has done, I don't think nobody can can really belittle that, the way that he's been able to speak out about these issues as, as in, in such an incredi incredibly um, alpha masculinity uh, sort of sport weight, yeah. and, 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 and yeah, the, the weight that, that comes with that. It's very easy yeah. to sort of just get on with that and not speak about um, these things like mental health and and seeking out therapy. Um, I think he's he's doing bits uh, in terms of 
you know, these these young kids that are coming up and seeing their heroes um, talk about seeking help because like that's massive. I'm sure like all of us growing up as when we looked up to footballers, we're like we we didn't have that. Um, no. So I think it's it's like really important for the next generation that that he's doing this, and yep. um, I'm really proud of him that that he's able to be that guy for Tottenham. And um, it's just it's so nice to see that he's obviously in a better place now. Um, he's smiling. We're seeing that like really funny video that came out over the international break with yeah. um, with Emerson. Um, so I, it's it's good, and I'm hoping with that happiness comes goals. And yeah, he, he cracks on, and, and like all the other players we've spoken about. Uh, tonight, that the next ten games, he can he can turn it on and deliver some some more goals for us and good moments because uh, I'd love to see it. Yeah, lovely words there, Sam and Pat. I don't know if you're gonna, again. I'm sure you echo those as well. I mean, look in the age that we live in now, um, you know, modern era. You know, again, I, the good thing is about mental health that there's become a lot more awareness with it. You know, we are now seeing a lot of high profile individuals come out and really raise the awareness that's needed about it because we know there's people that are struggling there every day. You know, I've got to say, we receive so many kind messages about the podcast from people that just say, look, you don't realize how much the podcast means just to kind of have that as an escapism from life. So again, you know, to those people, again, thank you so much. And to the wider population out there that are all struggling, I think the biggest thing you take from an interview like that is that it's good to talk. Don't hold back talking. Don't hold back sharing. You know, anyone that's struggling out there, go and get help because um, there's only one way out of it. And that, of course, is to try and seek the help because ultimately, as we've seen, you know, there's people with all different kinds of problems in their life, all different kinds of levels of what people are going through financially in different places. But um, we're all human. We all suffer, you know, different things in our life. We all suffer loss. We all suffer sad moments and we all need someone there to pick us up. So, I mean, Pat, it's really important. I think the message from Richie there is out to the world and hopefully more will buy into that, Pat, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, this international break has been really boring and uh, every one of us is itching, chomping at the bit for the football to start. But I thought the Richarlison interview is probably the most beautifulest and wholesome interview mm -hmm. and moment of this international break. And yep. funny enough, I was scrolling on Twitter and I literally just saw this before the show started. And uh, Simon Yamain, apologies if I spoke, <laughs> I pronounced your surname wrong, Simon, but a good friend of um of the channel, you know, big Spurs fan, uh, and he, he put a tweet out, basically quote tweet in the interview, saying, thank you, Richarlison. This will help people, maybe even save lives. Many struggle with depression. Most just want to feel like they're not alone. You just made them feel seen, showed a way. Proud to have you representing our badge. Love you with a light white lily heart. Um, heart. Uh, yeah. And then uh, Richarlison responded, just saying, thanks, bro, with three white um, heart emojis. And I thought that was a really wholesome obviously interview and just a really nice quote tweet. And then obviously with Charleston seeing that and responding. So it just yeah. goes to show these guys do see what you put out there. And um, it does take a toll on on some of the players. Not everyone's strong enough to bat it off. And I just think with Charleston's amazing to come out and say that, uh, say this, and it's not the first time he's opened up. And it takes, uh, you know, you're putting yourself in a really vulnerable state. You're already quite fragile emotionally. And obviously you're going through a lot and then you're putting it out there. and it, you know, not everyone's going to take it and be positive about it. You're still going to get some trolls and negativity, but he's rose amongst all of that to possibly help one, two, three, five, ten, twenty 10, 20 people. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And um, I think it's great when I see, you know, people respond in that manner because it shows them that they're being brave and they're being seen. And also it will hopefully help others. So I just think it's great. And like what Sam's doing as well uh, on Saturday, moments like this mean a lot. Because mm. we're going through really tough times and, um, you know, some of us uh, are managing, some of us aren't. But when you see people coming together for the community, I just think it's, it's brilliant. So yeah, Football yeah. sometimes is it's more, it's bigger than just football. And yeah. uh, moments like this make me remember that and realise that. Mm. Sometimes, James, you know, an interview like that, if it just helps one person, right? I mean... It's, it's huge. I mean, I don't know if Richarlison, I mean, I'm sure he knows the reach he's got as a person. And again, not just in his homeland, what that will do, hopefully, for the world of football, for football fans. And we know, again, as you know, James, as well, when you're at that stadium and you see those people that share that joy of you playing there and just, again, those moments they have with friends, family, they're special moments. So that can connect and help, if not, again, just one person. It's a great thing, right? Yeah, well, first off, everybody speaking right now about it, it, it in a beautiful manner. So well done, uh, and I and I totally echo everything that's been said. It, in I can remember Richardson saying about how hard it was in his background to talk about it. So that on top of it, 
I think it, like he, he wasn't the thing that he could approach with his family, he felt. And I, I don't know if you've, we've all been in similar situations to something like that, the alpha male that Sam um, was touching upon. But then he's then he's not only done that, then he's come out knowing that he's got a voice and been so brave to, to talk to so many people because he's know he's got the platform to do that. That is just incredible. And very, very proud that he wears our badge that uh, to do something like that. And uh, yeah, I echo uh, Patrick, Sam and yourself, Ricky on it. Um, it's you just just talk uh, anybody that's going through things like that at the moment, just start off with talking to people and notice that there's there's going to be similarities with how other mm. others are feeling. And for Richarlison to use his platform for that. Yeah, like I say, very, very, very proud. He's a, he's a Spurs lad. And yeah, it, it's a, it puts football into a completely different perspective, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. I guess we all use football for escapism sometimes in our, in our lives for what we've got going on. And um, I th I, what Simon says in, in the, what the Patrick's tweet that he, that he read out, that's it, it so eloquently and beautifully put. Um, I think it, it would have saved lives, and I think it's that big. And very, very proud of him. And let's let's give him an incredible reception Spot. on Saturday uh, on, off the back of that. Yep, Spawn. Lovely words there, guys. Right before we look ahead to Luton, just a couple of snippets of updates. Uh, Alistair Gold, friend of the show, Ali has put out during this international break. Spurs have shown an interest in Genoa attacker Albert Goodmanson, who has made history in the last couple of weeks with an important hat trick for Iceland. He's been the shining light. For the season of the Serie A side, as you know, are able to play in either up to three roles up front or just behind the main striker. He's netted 12 goals and laid on four assists from 29 matches, mostly out wide for Genoa to help the promoted team into a comfortable mid-table position. Uh, reports in Italy have suggested those Spurs won't be the only team in the race for the player. There's understood to be interest as well from Napoli and Juventus. What might help Spurs in terms of swaying him to North London is that the player is represented by GG11. The agency who helped Spurs secure Guillem and Ricario on the books and have played a pivotal role in bringing Radu Dragashin to the club in January. We know Ange admitted on the back of the window ending in January that in relation to arrivals and the way in Spurs want to do them, he said, look, in terms of an area in the park, that creative midfielder role, we'll look to try and strengthen. But I think we'll look to try and strengthen all areas of the park come the end of the season. That planning is already underway and the other people are in charge of it at the moment as we speak. And Tom wants to ask you, James, do you dread the transfer window to potentially difficulty of making a song to fit a name? Oh, got... <laughs> By the way, James doesn't bottle this question. We just need to unmute him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, if I've done Poster Coglu... Yeah, what do you want to worry about? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that, was the, that was the end boss in a computer game, isn't it? Poster Coglu. Completely, you know what I mean? so, yeah, I mean, mate. I find it fun, yeah. I find, I find it really fun with the transfer windows. <laughs> But he, he's been the he's been the hardest one to deal with. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question. No problem at all. There you go. We'll keep an eye on that one for you. And before we do look ahead to Luton, a couple of uh, snippets in terms of friendly updates. Look, for some this might have come too early. Um, Tottenham have confirmed the pre-season friendly with Bayern Munich. That game will see Spurs reunited with former striker Harry Kane and long-term servant alongside him Eric Dyer. Uh, they will take part as part of the Malta Cup clash, being at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. You know, the reason why I'm laughing is, could you just imagine, obviously, Harry ends the season with nothing. The first thing he wins is this Malta Cup oh, at Tottenham. Cup. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the year before that, like, he's smashing four goals in against Shaq Dalton I mean, he's just playing with Madison. Couldn't make it up. Um, yeah, someone's going to end their trophy drought over Tottenham. Yeah, Malta. couldn't make it up, could you? He ends the trophy drought against Tottenham in a pre-season friendly. Did Listen, you see... You see the what the top goal scorer trophy looks like for Germany. I've not seen it. What's it look like? It's it's the Arsenal uh, that got like a gun that, that, like, like, cannons. Yeah. Cannons. Couldn't make it up, could you? Couldn't make it up. I don't know. I mean, Pat, is it too early? Do you think it's too early? A year? I mean, less than a year after leaving this Bayern Munich friendly. But then again, we understand it was actually part of the contract agreed in the terms when Spurs agreed to sell Harry to Bayern. Have you got a problem with that friendly at all? Or do you relish it? It's a big friendly. It's on the eve of the season, a week before. Many would maybe say it's perfect preparation. How do you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, I don't really have a problem. I think right now we need to just focus on the matter, the, the matter at hand, which is the end of the season and finishing strong, as we've all said um, many a time today. I don't really have a problem. We all knew that, like you said, it was in the negotiations and part of the Harry Kane to Munich thing. 
you know, it is what it is. I, I saw Spurs sent me um, an email t- talking about the preseason Melbourne game and saying, mm-hmm. you know, do you want to buy your tickets? And again, I'm like, oh, it is a bit soon, but it is what it is. I mean, you know, Tottenham as a football club, it is a brand and it is a corporation and they need to do what they need to do. But I think for us fans, we just need to focus on what's going on now. And obviously, yeah. Saturday's literally around the corner and then the yeah. games are coming thick and fast. So, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to get upset or worried about that. It, yeah. it, is, it is every team, every big team is is organising fixtures. I'm, I'm seeing our Newcastle fixtures being announced, Arsenal fixtures, City, everyone's doing it. So, it is yeah. just part of what football is now. Yeah, I think the key old course is obviously, Sam, coming to you that you've got to get prepared for pre-season early because, again, we saw... Last summer, the disruption where we didn't even have a manager. I mean, going into the summer. And, you know, again, we see a situation where Spurs really had, they had one game called off, as we know. Bless Jason in Thailand. Didn't get to see the team. I'm going over there to see him. Uh, I mean, Sam, how much does that water the prospect seeing Spurs against Bayern? Is that a tasty friendly for you? Excited about that one? It's a bit of a weird one, isn't it? It's kind of like, yeah, bumping into an ex that you didn't have closure with um, <laughs> after a breakup. <laughs> but... Um, no, I think, like, yeah, I, I, I haven't really had time to digest it yet. I, I, I'm not really sure how I feel. I, I think it's like a great opportunity for maybe fans that don't usually get tickets to see two world class teams play against each other, and yep. hopefully Harry gets a nice reception. Um, and it's it's just like the, the cliche that they always say: it's it's minutes in the legs, isn't it? So yep. if you, it's 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 probably more more worthwhile having a game against Bayern Munich than it is Leighton Orient um, in terms of the sort of performance preparation um and yeah i guess the, the only thing that i'd say about it's probably a little bit of a shame that they're that it's not um a charity event i don't think it's it's just like a sponsored yeah. malta cup thing that it's they've paid a lot of money for it to happen it's contractual i feel like there's always a good opportunity to do something like we did last season with uh Shakhtar donetsk um and you know raise a bit of money for something that they, they don't have the option to do in, in the main season. So that, yeah. that, that'd be my, my only thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, again, it's interesting. James, go over to you. Um, it will be the 12th meeting between the two sides and obviously the first since their Champions League meetings in the 29-20 season. As we know for Kane, it will allow that return in terms of him playing again at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. How weird will that be, James? I know, again, it's a way off, as Pat says there, and we've got bigger things on the, bigger things on the horizon, but weird seeing him come back and play in red. James, potentially? Oh, saying playing red has just thrown me right at the end. Um, well, I welcome these. Uh, they're going to be Champions League semi-finalists, aren't they? So they're going to be a bit tired, at least. Let's hope they are. Tell you what, James. If they, if they don't, I'll be emigrating. This won't be a last one on Spurs podcast if they don't. Because I tell you, my, I tell, my WhatsApp chats at the moment are just absolutely muted. So that can't happen, right? They've yeah, got to be. Yeah. If, if, if they get, if Arsenal get through the semi, our phone's going in the Thames. But um, <laughs> no, I, I think, yeah. Oh, I, this I, podcast. I, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll welcome it. I think it's, but yeah, again, what Sam's saying, if it's uh, using opportunity for it to be to charity, it'd be, it'd be amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm just, um, I think before the season, having a, having a real top team come in, it, it can only be good, but um, yeah. get us ready for the season. But I think this all the time as maybe an other Spurs fans think, but I, I really believe next season is the one <laughs> to, oh. to begin. So, but yeah. I, that's almost turning up to be like a, a sitcom punchline, isn't it? To keep saying stuff like that. But yeah, I, as we say for the 150th time. <laughs> yeah, this is the year. But I, I do <laughs> think, I think so. So like having that test just before can only be a good thing. I'd, I'd, I'd mm. imagine isn't it like a contractual thing there with Harry Kane from the start yeah. when, yeah. and maybe, maybe he's coming back and he's, he's playing for us. Wow. Uh, I mean, do you know what I mean? You never, you never. Say James, throw a spanner in the works there. Yeah, Wouldn't you love it? Don't see Bayern yeah. Munich in a mural. Do you know what I mean? You think, so. you think knock, knock, knocks Arsenal out, Bayern go out of the semis, oh. and then well, go out, go out of the semis, and then suddenly he comes back to Tottenham. Is he just quickly on that? Is he? He's not injured, is he? Like I know he's, I know he's picked up. No, a I, th- I think you know we've been keeping an eye on it. I think he's, from what I understand, he's back in some form of relative training. Because I want to see he's, that he's, he's fit to play this weekend. I've I've just yeah. read today. Yeah, he's done it I mean, again. He's done it not, again. I was speaking actually to Lee this week at that point. Lee's coming on a show for us later in the season for the Arsenal game. Uh, it's funny because on, on the points you're making there, you know, I've been thinking during the international break, you're seeing stones go off, Walker go off, you're yeah. thinking, all yeah. this going on before that City game. You know, I can't make it up. But Saka not, not turning in. Oh, Pat, honestly, Odegaard, just, don't get me yeah. started. Don't get me started. Mental. We can't be... Harland as well. Harland <laughs> didn't. So, yeah, oh, they're all what? 
<laughs> See where the show goes if you let you not let your mind go for a second. Um, just so I do finish up on the friendly news, um, there has been an update this week from the, I believe they're going to look into that Spurs Newcastle friendly that has been arranged in Australia. Uh, the PFA may scupper that idea, given the nature of the fact it's coming right at the end of the season. Obviously, we've got the Euros on top of that. And it's one to really keep an eye on. Spurs, of course, we had Scott Munn over in Australia last week speak glowingly about the fact it's a great opportunity for a lot of the fellow Aussies that I know listened to last one on Spurs, you last one on Spurs, to go and see, of course, that uh, potential first team in action. And, of course, it's not an opportunity you get every day. So we hope for those adoring fans over there. It does happen. But one to keep an eye on as to how that does play out between now and these next few weeks. What we are going to do... We are going to go for our final break of this show for our listeners on audio. So this break, you're going to hear from the We Are Luton podcast who give you their thoughts ahead of the game. We're going to come back and give you a quick 510 on Luton. Right, guys, it is time to look ahead to Luton. It's obviously for Tottenham a huge game in the context of the season. You guys touched on it at the very, very start. So we're just going to bring you what we understand to be the latest news at the moment for Tottenham in terms of the game itself. Obviously, it all pins around Mickey van der Ven to some degree. We'll obviously get that update from Ange in terms of the pre-match presser to know exactly where we stand on him. But uh, for Luton in general, you know, they've had a really interesting season, obviously buoyed by the fact they've had that Nottingham Forest news come through of their four-point deduction. It means that at the moment for Luton Town, they are really in their own destiny in terms of whether they remain in the Premier League. And, you know, in terms of the game for them, you have to wonder how they'll approach it. We'll come to you, Sam, if we can, to start this one. How do you see Luton approaching the game? And will they be more expansive than the teams we have seen play at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium in the last couple of months? I don't think they'll be any more expansive than, than what we've seen, unfortunately. I know those that are going to the game and those watching it probably don't want to hear that. But I think history has told us that in the last last few months that if you if you want to sit in a low block against Tottenham you, you you've got a bit of luck I think there's probably a hell of a lot better chance of them winning the game playing like that uh, than there is for them to come out and and potentially get obliterated by by Tottenham in 10 minutes um, so yeah I'm hoping that they come out and play but I don't I don't think that they will um, I, I, I know that we'll, we'll probably have a, a, a really really tough game I can't see them um, like rolling over but yeah, I'm hoping we can get it done. Fingers crossed. Uh, James, come over to you. When you look at where they are at the league, man, they sit 17th. <laughs> I hate doing this. I hate saying stuff like this. I know Andy Costa's waiting to call me after I mentioned these stats. <laughs> I can just, I'm waiting for the phone to ring. Uh, they were about a win in eight games. <laughs> Should be doing this. Um, James, you felt fairly confident before the game. Well, you did put your hand over your mouth when you said comprehensive win. Yeah, Should be a comprehensive win. Like yeah. Um, <laughs> Should be a comprehensive I, win, right? Should be. <laughs> I think, um, I, yeah, I think, like, with in regards to Luton, like, that they, they are a lot better at home. It's like a cup tie, Kenilworth Road. That smaller pitch, and everything's all enclosed and stuff. I, I think with, uh, with them being away, yeah, I, I don't think they're getting as good performances away from home. I do think that, uh, I think someone touched upon it earlier. I think it's going to be. Yes, it is going to be low block FC. But I think there'll be the five, ten minutes where we do obliterate like we did with Brentford and stuff. And I think that that'll just turn the whole game. Um, and last time we was playing it, we was playing them at Kenilworth Road. Yep. With 10 men. So, uh, and that was nil-nil when it was 10 men, I think. It was before half time, wasn't it? That was so, um, yeah, I, I, I think I think I'm going to, I'm going to go for 5-1. I honestly reckon it's that. And I hate saying stuff like that. And I think mm. every Spurs fan's going, shut up. But um, <laughs> but uh, I think it's going to be 5-1. You, know I mean? <laughs> you know, it's funny. You know, I think back, Pat, to that Luton game. You know, I know many have sometimes rewatched it since. You know, Spurs had three huge chances in the first seven minutes of that game. Oh, yes. And they had two off the left side, one through the middle. Uh, they actually, Luton passed the halfway line in possession just twice in the yes. reverse fixture. One from a goal kick, which we instantly won it back. Then the other, we won back within three seconds. I mean, Pat, when I'm throwing this stuff at you, we should be saying it's a routine win, but we know with Tottenham, we're never going to be making it as easy as that, are we, really? On, paper, are we? And on paper and statistically, it should be a routine win, but we know that the Premier League is 
is is the best world uh, league in the world because it does throw banana skins and every game is a potential shock and that's why everyone loves to watch it because games like this is where you you possibly could see an upset and um obviously on paper yeah it's chalk and cheese but at this stage of the season everyone's got something to fight for Luton will be fighting for their lives to stay in the Premier League I do like them as a club, like I said earlier. I, I really want them to stay up this season because it is a fairy tale season, considering where they come, uh, where they came from. Even their ground, the fact of it's like one of the real uh, like throwback grounds, and it's still mm. got that purity, and it's yeah. it's a real old fashioned stadium. But like I said, not at our expense. And you know they've got some big games coming up. Hopefully they can take points off the other big boys. But we need you know all all three points and. Obviously, if we play to our potential, it should be a battering, like James is saying. But it's going to be hard. It's not going to be an easy game. Luton uh, do set up quite well defensively. They're going to sit behind the ball. They're going to try. And I mean, I was looking at all the stats and stuff today. They they played the most long balls in the league this season. So they're not going to try and play tick attack of football. It's going to be direct. They've yep. got some good players. Uh, Doughty is a very good fullback, and he's going to try and obviously great hurt us. Well. Cross. Yeah, great, great crosses, great delivery. Yeah. He's going to hurt yeah. us yeah. crosses. Yeah. They've got they've got pace yeah. in the front line, so they you know they've got threats as well. Um, they yeah. do score quite a lot of goals, to be fair, for a team sitting that low in the in the league. But they also concede quite a lot of goals. So, you know, obviously it's it's a game which is um really interesting for a lot of people, but. With all that being said, we just need to do what we need to do. Um, yeah. We're going to have the lion's share of the ball, but it's just how we use it. Spot on. You know, um, I really need to see us try and get Madison involved and not just be predictable. Uh, and like you said, Ricky, take our chances when they come because even against um, Fulham, where we were awful, we missed. We had we created four big chances and we uh, missed four Johnson, big chances. Son. Yeah, uh, Johnson yeah. had two big chances. Uh, you know, convert Son. some of our big yeah. chances. And yep. different games in all of these games. Villa, where we lost 2-1. West Ham, yep. where we lost 2-1. The amount of big chances we keep missing in these games. Another stat I saw, which is very interesting. Sonny's created the second most big chances in the league this season at 17. But he's only got, I say only, it's not. It's a great stat. He's got eight assists. So how we many... you a lot about the conversion. Yeah, exactly. The conversion's yep. been awful. So, you know, yep. we just need to do what we're doing. Have the ball, yep. but use it properly. And it should be okay. Um, you know, I, I want to see Madison. It was great to see Madison, um, England. It kind of like almost reminded me of Spurs in the sense that they were losing a game which they didn't deserve to lose. They kept pushing and pushing. Madison created, you know, a really nice chance. And obviously, um, Bellingham tucked it away. We need to see that kind of Madison um, on Saturday. But from the offset, not in the 97th or 93rd minute. Need to see yeah. it from minute yeah. one. And we'll yeah. be all right. Yeah. Totally agree. Listen, I think Bark is another player we should give a mention to in terms of ones to watch because um, he's been formidable for Luton this season and one I wouldn't be surprised to see a potential big summer move for him. You know, again, I think Bark is really reinstating himself to be a really decent midfielder, one to keep an eye on. Wouldn't be a bad player for Spurs, maybe, if they are going to be in Europe next season, of that have that wider squad, a player that has been linked with Tottenham in the past. Sam, I'll come round to you. We're going to kickstart predictions here. Before we do, from Luton's side of things, uh, they have got Albi, Albert, Sammy, Lukonga, who could return after missing the last month. Mad Anderson is amongst those who could return. Alfie Doty, as Pat said there, he should be okay despite picking up an issue last time out with Gabriel Osho also eyeing a return to action. Isn't it funny? You know when you read out a lot of these team news, isn't it? everyone's eyeing a return to action whenever they're playing Tottenham. You can't make this sense. You know, whenever I read the team news out of every game for a preview, they're all these players are eyeing a return when they're playing Spurs. Couldn't make it up. We'll start with you, Sam. What are we going for prediction wise? I'm going to say four one Tottenham. I think we'll be okay. we'll be back to our best. Okay, interesting. I like that. I like that. Spurs again. Anthony Costa's in the background. I can hear him going to still rattle in the call me here. Spurs have been <laughs> in the last ten Premier League games against Luton. I look to complete their first league double over the hat since 1983-84. And Luton have just won one of their last sixteen top flight games at Spurs, beating them three one in November 1985. Yes, I'll be running out of that stadium and you won't see me if this goes all tits up and I'll be behind James looking for backup and security. James, what are we going for weekend? 5 1 Tottenham. Uh, I love it. Super show. Well, I love that. Fantastic. And Patty, what are we rounding up with? Okay, um, some more stats. Luton haven't kept a clean sheet in nine matches and they haven't won a game in nine attempts. So, with all that being said, I'm going to say 3 1 Spurs. I'm not going to go as crazy as James and Sam, but I do think it'll be a a convincing win. Get back Amazing. on, you know, back on track. 
Three love one. it fantastic guys it has been a really really good show some lovely feedback guys thank you so much i say really good you feedback. what's your what's your prediction oh james we can let me go <laughs> away with it there, bud. Gotcha. Come on. Uh, i think i'll go for a three one spurs win we should be okay i'm not gonna be confident going for a four or a five one but i think three one only because the goals have slightly to some degree dried up a mm. little bit recently i know we had that great win against villa but the goals with you know we've been scoring goals but not the frequency we like i tell you what they get a couple of early ones it could be a really good Cricket yeah. score potentially. This is the thing, right? I mean, we'll keep my fingers crossed, guys. Make sure you go and check out Pat stuff for more of what he's doing on his channel. Uh, Sam, give us a reminder where can everybody find you on Saturday ahead of this game? I'll be at the Beehive, uh, just pub on Tottenham High Road. Just give it a Google, and and you'll find us there in the beer garden, um, taking pictures. Uh, come get your photo taken with your mates, your loved ones, by yourself, with me, with James, uh, whoever you can find. Uh, I'll be there from just before 12 taking pictures. You can message me on Instagram or on X uh, at Sam Liam Cornish uh, and I can book you in a slot or you can chance it and see if you can get a little walk in. But yeah, come through. All the money's going to Tottenham Food Bank. Amazing. Sam, lovely calls. And can I just say, what an amazing debut. If Spurs play as well as you've performed here, we'll be absolutely <laughs> fine, mate. Thank, Thank you, you so Ricky. much. Love to Pleasure to be here. Thank you again. Look forward to more. Best Jay. first debut since Jurgen Klinsmann against Liverpool. I love it, yeah, I do agree. I'll do take agree. it, I'll take right. it. I would say Jaffet Tanganga against Liverpool, but we know how that ended it, so I won't, I won't put yeah. that on Sam, because he won't, he won't come back after that. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> James, make sure we find you, mate, at the weekend for this game on Saturday. A reminder, where can they find you? So I'll be at Shelf Bar, uh, pre and post game. Uh, so I think just up not too long after the general admission opens, I'll be at Shelf Bar, Block 120, Level 1. Uh, and post game as well. So yeah, and you, if you go to the Voice of Spurs uh, on any of that in, on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, I'll be on all of that. But great show, guys! And really good to do it with you guys. That was amazing. Listen, great show, great vibe. Let's hope Spurs back out now and put in a performance and win we need ahead of a weekend where Spurs could go into the top four temporarily. Of course, they play first this weekend. So look, it's all in Spurs' hands. Let's hope they don't let us down from the wonderful Patrick Tyrant, from the brilliant Sam Liam Cornish, from the superb James Black. We have been the last word on Spurs. We're back with you soon. From all of us here, guys, keep safe, keep well. And as always, 